cross-pollination of different styles. Let's get let's get the the pop people wanting to know why is an event like this happening at the cutting room. Let's get the classical people asking why is this event happening at the cutting room. <laughs> and and so I I came up with the idea and of it was a it, you know it started out as a vehicle for myself but it also as with most things that happen it becomes a vehicle for for others and f because I'm not the only one in in that position if if I'm feeling a need to have my voice heard guaranteed there's other people out there hi you're listening to conversations with musicians with Leah Roseman this podcast strives to inspire you through the personal stories of a diversity of musicians with in-depth conversations and great music that reveal the depth and breadth to a life in music. Martha Mook is a pioneer in the field of the electric five-string viola and transcends boundaries as a performer and composer. This episode features insights, stories, and music, including from the beautiful album by Carla Petullo, So She Howls, which just won the Grammy Award for Best New Age Ambient or Chant Album, as well as from several of Martha's solo and collaborative albums. You'll hear about the unique multi-style string program she's helped launch at New Jersey City University, and about many of her mentors and collaborators, from David Bowie to Tenzin Chogyal to Laurie Anderson to Jean-Luc Ponty. Martha is passionate about the breadth and diversity needed in music education for the 21st century, and it was a joy and an inspiration for me to be able to hear about the arc of her multifaceted career so far. Like all my episodes, you can watch this on my YouTube channel or listen to the podcast on all the podcast platforms, and I've also linked the transcript to my website, leahroseman.com. The podcast theme music was commissioned from composer Nick Cold, and you can use the timestamps to navigate the episode. Before we jump into our conversation, I wanted to let you know that this weekly podcast is in season four, and that I send out an email newsletter where you can get access to sneak peeks of upcoming guests and be inspired by highlights from the archive. Have a look at the description of this episode, where you'll find all the links, including the support link to buy this independent podcaster a coffee. Now to Martha Mook. Hey, Martha. Thanks so much for joining me here today. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I love the, the twinkly lights. And I, I was going to ask you about this sort of thing, because I know you're very um, cognizant of the necessity in, in terms of concert presentation to have you know, create a beautiful vibe. Now, um, we're going to be sharing lots of your recorded projects and talking about, you know, your teaching and all kinds of cool stuff. But I know you're willing to do a little demo on your electric viola. So do you want to do that towards the beginning of the episode? Sure. I'm actually in the process of writing a new piece. It's going to be premiered next week. Um, it, it's a little bit of a stretch for me. It's it's a piece for electric viola and electric harp. I have a wonderful harpist that's joining our uh, concert next week at NJCU, Edmar Castaneda. Okay. And uh, he's all wired up and uses electronics, and uh, I've got wires and electronics, and we'll see what happens. So um, just to explain, retuned my viola, mm -hmm. scordatura. So it's become a transposing instrument. And so when I'm, I'm notating it, because eventually it will be notated, be notated um, both as I play it and as the, as the sounds come out, as the pitches come out. So um, I'll give you a little bit of an idea of the instrument. This is a, my Yamaha YEV five string electric viola, violin, serves both purposes. Mm -hmm. So this is the this is the sound. So it's quite nice. It's tuned to a B flat with a with an A in there, in seventh. Now that's all fine, but here's where the fun really starts. Thank you. 
All right. Very cool. It's just a um, little idea of the sound of it, a um, little improv, and that's how I discover ideas, just kind of explore around the sound of the instrument and with the electronics. And I've got the top of the line, uh, oh, you can't see it, uh, Eventide um, H90. So what were you using in terms of um, processing and the different layers? What was going on with all that? From the from the viola, I go into the the H ninety. It's a multi effects processor, um, and I have an expression pedal that also um, changes the parameters. And uh, so it's controlled with with uh, this H ninety control, mm -hmm. and um, this tells me exactly what the effects are that's that are in the um, particular algorithm in the effect um, and then I can and you can see it moving a little bit that's the expression pedal so um, the uh, the the in, the it, I call it, it's an instrument basically um, comes with with preloaded uh, algorithms and then it's up to the player to up to myself to fine-tune them the way that I like so um, I'm liking this quite a lot. Okay. Playing with it and experimenting, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens next week. <laughs> <laughs> so the harp player, his name is is Edmar, right? Edmar Castaneda. So yeah. he always plays standing up. Yes. <laughs> it, it's it's um it's a harp that it's a it's not a classical pedal harp. Mm -hmm. It's a lever harp, and um. It's it's indigenous to uh, he's from Colombia, mm -hmm. and so that is the harp that that comes from the from his culture from his country, and um, what he does with it is just astounding. Yeah, I've it, I've seen him play on on like the internet, but yeah, that must be a really fun collaboration. Yeah, I I've known Edmar for many many years, and to have this opportunity to collaborate with him and and bring him in. To, to work with directly and to also work with my students. Um, it's a real real treat and a real learning and amazing growing process for them and for me. So before we get into that, I, I just want to understand this piece. So is it, there must be improv integrated into stuff that you've written? Yes, yeah, so um, there's the sound palette that it's pretty much what what you heard mm -hmm. given and, give and take uh there, there's a few more uh patches and um and there'll be sort of a a, a concept i i'm very big on concept composition and um some and a, a structure of sorts um and we'll sort of I have some ideas that I'm going to put down, but there will be a lot of improvisation. There'll be a lot of, for me, in the in the music, it's very important about the connection and the, the um, interaction between the musicians. So um, we'll see. It's still it's still formulating. I'm kind of excited because it's been a while since I've written a piece like this. Mm -hmm. What what do you mean by like concept driven composition? It's mm, it's a, the way that I've been composing for many years. Um, very non-traditional, like most of the things that I do. Um, I'm not driven particularly by harmonic structures and formats, or even rhythmic. Or um, I sort of defy all those mm -hmm. rules and regulations. And um, what it's allowed me to do is free me up to explore sounds, explore collabor collaborations of sounds, meaning um, when I'm playing through this effects box or any, any effects box, I actually consider that to be my uns an ensemble mm -hmm. and trial and error because with every articulation, this, the same setting is going to sound different. Like if I pizzicato, mm -hmm. it'll sound totally different than when I'm playing with the bow and when I'm playing with harmonics. And so I'm constantly um, experimenting with different sounds, different qualities of sounds, different textures. 
because um, I feel that that's a very important part. The dimensionality of, a, of music is very important, and I think it's um, oftentimes not in, in, in especially the listener's perception. Mm -hmm. It's very experiential. Yeah. From the, the, the actual creation of, of the work and the process of the work, Mostly, also, my pieces are never finished, <laughs> even if they're recorded. Because of the nature of adding improvisation, they're always going to keep evolving, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the beautiful part of that. And that's the beautiful part of live performance as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm, I'll get into that in in, um, in in a little while. But um, so concept, yeah. I, I think of I think of an idea I think of um, room space everything except the little black dots on the mm -hmm. on the on the page when I'm composing when I'm creating <laughs> one of the tracks I wanted to include part of was your ice from ice four because it's so textural and percussive I thought it'd be really interesting for people to hear how you use the viola mm. Yeah, th that's it. Well, that was another, the title came from uh, Concept Ice 4. Um, several years ago, my mother got a new iPhone, and my sister was helping her program it in, and, and I called her one day, and, and she said, oh, it's Ice 4. I said, what do you mean it's Ice 4? <laughs> she said, in case of emergency. And in her phone, I was in case of emergency number four. Okay. And I said, well, but you only have two daughters, so you need to explain that. <laughs> but that's where the, that's where the title came from. Um, and then it, it was just sort of an exploration of different understandings of the word ice. Okay. This is a clip from Ice 4 from the album No Ordinary Window. Are you inspired by visual ideas or like just pure emotion or, you know, what I mean, or more narrative? It's, it's different um, for each piece that I go in, in with. Usually I'll have an I idea, uh, a, a concept. For example, a few years ago, I did a, um, a piece that, that was called um, Dreaming and Sound. And that it, that just the title of that i've actually done a series of of works 
explore um, dreams, dream a dream in sound, dreaming in sound, dreams in sound. Um, for solo viola, for with my quartet, um, and then uh, dreaming in sound was um, it was very involved. Lots of lots of electronics, lots of um, the sound. I had four different speakers in the room, and so I had it hooked up to um, a program, Max MSP, that was I was able to change where the sounds were coming from. So rather than just um, stereo, left and right, I could actually have the, the, the sounds circulating around the mm -hmm. room. Um, and so it was a lot, I'm always involved with choreography at my, because my effects and my looper pedal are all at my feet. Um, but I kind of gave myself a re really big challenge with that one because I had an extra set of pedals to control okay. where the sounds were going. Um, but the, the whole idea of dreaming in sound was lucid dreaming, you know, the, um, the sleep process where, where you travel to, um, where the, it was also tied in with, with constellations and as it was being, so here, an, a, another example of that, it was, it was commissioned for, um, um, a festival in Prague and so one of my favorite things in the middle of the city of Prague is that clock the astronomical mm -hmm. clock and I I incorporated that into the piece as as if you know when you're when you're dreaming sometimes something that you just saw right before you went to sleep enters into your dream and it has no meaning whatsoever except that it's somehow in your consciousness and it needs to be involved so that that was one example of uh how i i put different different things together um and came up with that concept of mm -hmm. dreaming in sound um and then that evolves into something else after that I'm, i do a lot of evolving yeah <laughs> so i th let's go to your um your program at new jersey city university i was so happy to find out about this and i know you kind of got started during the pandemic during lockdowns was there any yeah. kind of silver lining to that oh that's how i try to um um journey in my in my life is that you know, we're always going to be thrown curved balls and there's always going to be obstructions and it's never going to be always the right time for something. And I think if that lockdown time, the time of COVID, um, really pro proved anything was that you need to be able to reframe and pivot to be able to continue on. And and so I, had, I have always looked at mistakes as opportunities. Being an improviser, I get that. I get a lot of opportunities, <laughs> let's say. Um, but being able to incorporate that into my performance and also as a teaching tool, teaching improvisation, um, teaching students, teaching teachers that because we're, we're, we've, we're so ingrained, like, don't do that. Don't play anything that sounds awful. Practice, 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 so it's perfect. And that's fine for certain things, but it's so ingrained that you've kind of erased a lot of our, the, the beauty of being a child and the naivete of, um, of being able to create and conjure up on the, in the spur of the moment. Coming back to, to COVID and the first thing that um, that I realized when, you know, two weeks after when we realized that this was going to be probably the long haul, I was able to pivot pretty quickly because I already had uh, experience with technology and knowing how, um, how to plug things in and turn things on and make things work. And uh, those were the early days of Zoom. All of a sudden, everybody was was zooming and, and learning how to how to do that. And so that whole thought of 
how can we reframe, pivot that idea that we're we're faced with this situation that we kind of have no control over? How do we get control back? Is to is to call it something else. Okay, so so when they invited you to put together this program, had their um, string program kind of died out, or was it on life support? Once upon a time, there was a, a pretty vibrant string program at New Jersey City University, and um, for whatever you know reasons that happen in in mu music programs, it sort of faded away, and um, there was maybe one string major. And I was brought in to, uh, as an adjunct, to revive the string program. Um, and, and their thought was to, you know, for classical and and maybe Broadway. And they had a classical uh, performance major, and um, I had been doing research for many many years on different kinds of programs that are exist out there or that are being created, like the, the um, programs at Berkeley College of Music. Um, and there were these entrepreneurial musicianship programs popping up and musical entrepreneurship. And and I just, between the research I was doing with that, I didn't know why I was doing the research. It just wasn't interesting to me to, to see what was out there. I don't know, maybe I was going to apply to a program. I, I really don't know that. But it went hand in hand with my experience as a professional player and creator and improviser, I'm, I'm self-taught. I mean, I have a master's degree in viola performance. But everything else, I've taught myself the electronics, I've taught myself improvisation, basically I've taught myself composition. And maybe that, you know, I have a little bit of an outsider approach to a lot of things. But I always thought, you know, it'd be really interesting if I had had the opportunity to have kind of a program that offered all these different things that I've been um, acquiring over the years mm -hmm. through experience. And um, and so I, you know, it was one of those aha moments. I've had a few in my life where I, I woke up one morning and the term multi-style strings just popped out of, out of my head and I started writing a proposal for the string program, which was sort of based around my career path because it's, you know, I can, um, I have the tools, and many string players have the tools to be wonderful performers, but what happens when you, your livelihood goes away for two years, and you can't go out and play Broadway, or you can't go out and play, at, you know, at the Met, or, the sh or any show, or tour, um, you can't rehearse with your friends, and so, the, that was part of having the tools to teach to teach the tools of what do you do if if that happens. Um, I learned from Berkeley that part of their mantra is that every graduate is um, is a, an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and, you know, a, a small business um, entrepreneur, and you've got to you've got to own that that. Uh, because of the nature of how the music industry, the music business has been changing over the years, you, you know, there's no guarantee that even if you're the best violinist in in the in the world, that you're going to have a job, that you're going to be able to support yourself with only playing the violin. There are certainly positions about that. I'm gonna, I know I'm going to have some some hate mail saying that, but. Um, I, I, I really believe that you, for musicians now in this 21st century graduating, um, they need to, to have the skills to play their instruments. They also need the skills to be able to turn on gear, electronics, to record themselves, to do, to do Zoom, to set up microphones, to set up a... Um, a, a PA system, plug in, get an app, use electronics. All this, all this is here at our disposal. And there's no, really, there's not an argument to say we shouldn't use it. 
because I'm pretty sure that if Mozart had had some pedals back back in those days, he would have had them plugged in. He would have, you know, we would have had a, a Mozart electric requiem or so. Yeah, no, I agree. So you're right across from Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And do you want to talk a little bit about the faculty? Yes. Yeah, so the New Jersey City University is, at, is in Jersey City, which is very close to Manhattan. You can see Manhattan from the sixth floor. <laughs> um, and so there's it's easy access into, you know, the culture capital of the world. And when I was set, so setting up the program, creating it, um, and little did I realize I would actually be tasked with creating a brand new performance degree because multi-style performance wasn't an option. It was either classical or jazz. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the emphasis on all styles are legit. It's not just classical or an al alternative to classical or jazz. That's where the multi-style comes in. So, um, and over the course of my career, I have cultivated a lot of friends, wonderful friends who are, you know, at the top of the game in the music industry, um, especially in the string world. And I'm, I called them all up and I said, I'm creating this new program at New Jersey City University. It's a public university, so also the tuition is a lot less than a private institution. I said, we're, we're close to New York City. They can, the students can go in and out whenever they want to. Um, so I called, the first person I called was Regina Carter, who I've known for, for many years and talked to her about it. And I, I didn't know if that was anything she would be interested in. And she signed on right away. She loved the idea of the program. She's still a really big supporter of the program. And um, uh, she's, she's taught students um, in private lessons. She's come in and coached ensembles. She's performed. And um, it's just having her on the team has been so fabulous. And, um, and I so value her input in the program. Um, and so I also called my friend Jeremy Kittle, who is an amazing fiddle player. Um, who I've known since since he was a teenager and seen him just blossom with his own band and tours and um, I love his playing he what he brings to the fiddle world um, and he's, he's just he's a brilliant musician whatever whatever style he's playing and he agreed to s sign on because he liked what the program was um, was offering, and I also had some students that were fiddle players coming in, and I basically s would say to the students, if you had your choice of who to study with, who would your you know your dream be? And for most of the time, I've been able to make their dreams come true. <laughs> nice. Um, and I tapped uh, my friend Dave Egger on uh, on cello. I've don't, known Dave for many many years. Uh, one of the most brilliant musicians. Um, that I know, a uh, brilliant cellist, composer, arranger, um, pianist. Um, I mean, there's, there's not enough words for Dave. And what he brings to, the, to his, his knowledge of the industry and all, um, all of the, the artists that he's worked with and created string charts and arrangements for and tours that he's done. So um, he signed on right away, too, when I, when I asked him. So... Um, Another one was Joe Denenzone, who, um, you know, these are, these are people I've known for many years in different um, aspects of the string world. And I've known Joe to be a, 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 an amazing electric, I mean, he's a fabulous classical player as well, but jazz player, working with el electronics, with, with the pedals and loops, and um, just totally brilliant. So Joe came on board. And um, and na subsequently, in a, it's been about a year now. He's he's been out on tour with the band Kansas. So um, it's uh, it's been it's been pretty amazing to see everybody 
keeps growing, keeps evolving. We, and that is something that the students are, are seeing also, that their professors are not just stopping and just teaching. They are continuing in their career paths. And I'm not, I'm not putting down any teachers by any means because everybody's got lives that continue. But, but sometimes we think that, you know, your life doesn't continue, that, it, that when you're, you're just, you're in the classroom um, teaching skills, teaching information. And what I found as important to that is the teaching of experience, which includes being a professional, um, cultivating your, your network, um, being open to collaborations. Uh, some of the most amazing musical experiences I've had have been with people I have n absolutely nothing in common with in the music field. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I see that happening in, in the program um, because I, that's encouraged. Collaborations are encouraged. People that think they don't have they have nothing in common get together, sit on the floor, turn out the lights, plug in, and or just explore and see what happens. Allow yourself that that time and the space to do that. Um, and it's it's pr been pretty amazing to observe yeah. what what can happen and what can grow out of that. So is it just a master's at this point? So the master's kicked in first. It's just the nature of how programs are mm -hmm. approved. Um, and because it started up during COVID, so um, it started out with just a, a string quartet virtual, mm -hmm. obviously. And um, so now we're in our, we've had three graduating classes of master's um, candidates and um, in a few more weeks we'll have another another class graduating and the other thing that the bachelor's has been a little delayed in kicking in partly because because of COVID um, that those two two and a half years like decimated a lot of music programs especially string programs when um, that count on being in the same room and having that consistency of um, of playing and and interaction with the teachers and with with the fellow students. So n now the the string programs, and I'm hearing this from a lot, especially the, you know the the middle school and the and the high school teachers that I interact with. They're saying they're telling me, we, you know, by next year we're going to have, our seniors are going to be ready okay. for you. Good. Yeah, things are coming back. Yeah. yeah. I understand the wind and brass world, of course, is worse in terms of the fallout. Any form of, of art, performing art, that, um, that, that you, need the, you need to an ensemble to be in the room, yeah. you, or you need that interaction. So I can only speak for the, for the strings, but... I think we're going to see a re regrowth, a rebirth mm -hmm. in the next few, a renaissance perhaps. Yeah, I. It's really important that the emphasis that we that is being placed on STEM steams out <laughs> to include that the arts. Because there's a a part of the brain that is just so inspired by and motivated, I think, and touched by the by the arts are, are such a vital part of, of our, our being as humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautifully said. So if we could talk about your recent granny win with this beautiful project uh, by Carla Patula. Yes, yeah, so um, that was another beautiful, a lot of things have happened in my life that, is, that seem happenstance or, or coincidental. They have a, they have a meaning, and um, I met Carla first a number of years ago, just by chance. We were we were taking a film scoring workshop together. Uh, Carla lives out in L.A., and we just sort of bonded over that. And then we didn't see each other for a few years, and I didn't know until post COVID that she had also um, been stricken with a with a 
a very serious illness. Mm -hmm. the, the experimental treatment that helped her, um, along with the just letting out of, of these, these musical emotions, because she, she wasn't sure what was going to happen with that, and that was a, a form of therapy mm -hmm. in a way. And she reached out to me because we'd been talking about collaborating, not knowing how we would collaborate, but um, she really she wanted to work with with me, knowing the sounds that I um, that I create on electric viola, the vibe that surrounds what I do, uh, and my string quartet Scorchio. Uh, we've been working for the the last uh, twenty twenty one years um, as the in-house string quartet for the annual Tibet House Benefit concert that has been produced by Philip Glass. And so there's a special bond with that as well and all the different um, musicians and artists that we get to work with. And it's really, that's also the multi-style. That's, that's just, it's having the soul that can say yes to adapting yeah. to what, whatever style, whatever, whatever the needs are. And so um, Carla sent me the, the music and she asked me to, to put the session together. She was coming to New York. The vibe was important, the people that were important, the feel of the session was important. So, and by the end of the session, we, we knew something special had happened. And I don't know, you can say that, well, you know, it's a beautiful recording. Yes, it is. Um, it's also what went into that, which maybe I I think that's evident. I think if, when people listen to it, they they get the the sense of what went into that recording besides just the sounds. Mm -hmm. This track is "Machine Dreams" from Carla Petullo's "So She Howls," which just won the Grammy Award for Best New Age Ambient or Chant Album.
I was just talking with her. She's coming to New York in June, and we're putting together a show at the cutting room. Okay. So hasn't been announced yet, but uh, we're we're going to perform the album. Okay, wonderful. And the the vocal group in that Martha is Tonality, right? Yes. Because I think they were. Um, I did an episode last year with Emily Sankofa, media composer, and her score for the other black girl. They, she used them. I believe that was the group. Ah. So some of their music was featured in a totally different way on, on my right. episode with her. Hi, just a short break from the episode, which I hope you're enjoying so far. If you want to check out over 100 episodes you may have missed, in addition to your podcast player or YouTube, I have an extensive website, leahroseman.com, with show notes, transcripts, the complete catalogue of episodes, and you can sign up there for my weekly newsletter to get access to sneak peeks of upcoming guests. Please do share your favourite episodes with your friends, follow me on social media, and share my posts. And if you can spare a few dollars to help support the series, that would be amazing, and you can find that link in the show notes. I'm an independent podcaster, and I really do need the help of my listeners. Now back to the episode. So, so you mentioned the Tibet House, and that your quartet formed because of that initially, many yes. years ago. Yes. So, yeah, that that's a whole other story. Please of circum- <laughs> share. <laughs> um, probably my favorite story <laughs> to tell. Um, so, way back when, uh, in the late nineties, I. I guess um, I I had a, a chance encounter with Tony Visconti, who was David Bowie's longtime producer, and as as well as produced many other just amazing albums, and um, I think I was playing a a, a string in, in a string quartet, backing up the the band uh, the, the lead singer of the Zombies. Colin Blundstone <laughs> and Tony was backstage and we ended up talking and I, he liked my playing and I said well I also play viol- electric viola and, and we started a friendship and then he started um, and then I started contracting string sessions for Tony for, for the recordings that he was producing and the, the nature of, of what I do I, I don't know I, I never made a game plan of it but I always feel that if I feel like there's not a space for me or a place for my voice to be heard, I will figure out how to make it. And that's exactly what happened. Um, uh, being a composer and a member of ASCAP, the American Society of Composers, Authors and Publishers, and not really feeling where I had a home, because I wasn't really composing classical music. I wasn't composing any particular style of music, and I was playing electric viola and adding electronics and adding elements of all different styles of music. And at a meeting, I I just sort of stood up because I didn't know what else to do. And um, I proposed a, to do a showcase. I don't know, it sort of came out. <laughs> and I had called it uh, Through the Walls. And after a few meetings with some of the, the, the folks at ASCAP, um, they agreed to co- to co-produce it, and w- it was a series. lasted for eight years. Started in two thousand one, a series that showcased composer performers that were doing and creating music that defied categorization. All right, and so the the plan was for the very first show to be at the original um, address of the Cutting Room, which is a, a venue that um, I have a long time uh, affiliation with now, and they moved to uh, East 32nd Street. But Steve Walter, the owner, was a Berkeley grad, played guitar, but has such a, um, an interest in all styles of music. And we pitched this crazy idea of doing a an ASCAP concert music which means sort of classical new music in in this club mm-hmm. you know where they have um rock and roll and and all kinds of other uh, things that turn on and play loudly um and so that was another of my thought a collaboration meaning cross-pollination of different styles let's get 
w- let's get the the pop people wanting to know why is an event like this happening at the cutting room. Let's get the classical people asking why is this event happening at the cutting room. <laughs> and and so I I came up with the idea and a, it was a it, you know it started out as a vehicle for myself, but it also as with most things that happen it becomes a vehicle for for others and f- because I'm not the only one in in that position if I, if I'm feeling a need to have my voice heard guaranteed there's other people out there and there were mm-hmm. and there still are and so I I um I told Tony about this idea and I said what do you think about coming on board to to be the the host of the very first through the walls showcase. It was going to feature three different acts. It was uh, Ben Neal on mutant trumpet, trumpet that that he and he's still playing it with the electronics and and um, um, really interesting ways of of playing a horn. Uh, and then the other the other uh, composer performer was Eve Beglarian, who's also doing really um, advanced or uh, cross cultural cross multi style work. And um, and Tony loved the idea of um, of introducing it, and um, and so the plan was made. It was the the end of January of two thousand one, and the the day of the the premiere of the um, of the showcase, I was uh, talking with Tony, and um, and he said, "Well, I'd mentioned to my friend David that." Uh, I told him a little bit about this, I, you know, this event tonight, and he was interested, and I, and I'm, I said, yeah, right. <laughs> and um, so I go to the venue, we do the sound check, I'm, I'm running the, the video camera, I'm, I'm producing the thing and running around, and it comes to the time of the show, and the lights go out, everybody takes their seat, and they escort David Bowie to my table. <laughs> and he sits directly in front of me, and that's how I met David Bowie. And then Tony went up and did his introduction. Um, and it was it was beautiful. It was, you know, because he's so not, Tony is so knowledgeable about so different, so many different styles of music and his, and his string arrangements are just classics. And the work that he's done with Bowie's just, mm-hmm. you know, stunning. And um, and it was a really magical evening, and and David stayed at least through through my set, and then he had to leave because he had an early morning BBC interview or something. And shortly thereafter, I don't know if it was the next day or a day or two later, Tony called me and he said, um, David would like to know if you could put a string quartet together to play with him at Carnegie Hall for the Tibet House Benefit Concert that Philip Glass produces. <laughs> That's like, that's mic drop, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, what did I do? Of course, I called up some friends and um, I said, hey, uh, I think you might have some time to do this gig. <laughs> um, and it was a benefit concert, so nobody got paid. It was all, but, um, so that was the first time of um, getting together, really getting together and working with David. Um and I'll never forget the you know the first day going in for a rehearsal. It was at uh, when Philip Glass had his Looking Glass recording studios, and we went to rehearse there. I still have a picture somewhere with. We were sitting in the in the small room, and David is is sitting next to me, and I'm just like, you know, and we're rehearsing Heroes with string quartet, you know, to play with David Bowie. It's just not <laughs> registering that it's it's real. Um, and the, um, the sound check and then, and then, you know, it, it became real when we were backstage at Carnegie Hall just before going on and David walks in as David Bowie. I mean, the picture's a little worn out now, (laughs) but, you know, with makeup and his hair made and, um, just looking like that. And I went, Wow, I'm really gonna play with David Bowie. I'm, um, and so, 
and and we did and it it turned into a, th a three year collaboration where we played with David the, the following two years but we also in the interim um had some recording sessions with him both in New York and in upstate um on a few different albums um the the main one being Heathen which came out in 2002 and the the time that we spent recording with him i was up i was up there doing some solo work and then the quartet came up i was up there september 9th 2001 september oh. 8th september 9th 2001 yeah. yeah and the quartet we were planning to come back a few days later to to do more tracks and then you, mm. you know the world changed 9/11 um and so we, we had to sort of re reconfigure what what that all meant but we were after a few days when people were finally able to travel a little bit again um i lived up i lived in rockland county so it wasn't too bad for me but the rest rest of the quartet lived in manhattan mm -hmm. and they had to figure out how to get up there um but we did and we went up there and i remember getting up there and i they were watching uh probably cnn and and i think one of the the fi the last buildings was uh, sort of on its way down and it was a very very emotional time and I, that i think got absorbed into the into the sessions as well um very very meaningful um and recording in this beautiful uh studio up in um it's called Elaire outside of Woodstock and um so just amazing memories of working with david and 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 that whole time and and so um and it's hard to believe that it was 23 years ago yeah and all these years i mean you've been continuing to play in this uh tibet house benefit concert yeah so i'm actually the the only the, the, the original the only original member uh, since I I formed it, but we've had a few comings and goings, which is which happens with quartets. But I've played every year since two thousand one, mm -hmm. um, including there were two years that we were virtual because of COVID. Uh, but yeah, so we just the last one was uh, just about a month or so ago at Carnegie Hall, and um, so what happened it, the, in 2001 and that that first year we only played with David Bowie and Tony did the arrangements um for Hero and Silly Boy Blue uh which actually just came out a couple of years ago on his on the album called Toy mm -hmm. and but we recorded it back in 2001 or 2002 around that time um but so the next year David performed again and the following year and then other um other artists got this got the idea that there was a string quartet around and asked if they could you know borrow david bowie's string quartet <laughs> so um after the third year david david wasn't doing the uh the events anymore because people do you know a few years and then they sort of mm -hmm. um move move on move out um and then Philip just would would call me up and say, oh, you know, so and so is is coming in. David Byrne is coming in. Can you play with him? Or Rufus w Rain Wainwright, or Lou Reed, or basically any anybody that was that was coming in. And I was doing the arrangements for them. And it, you know, it's something about playing in Carnegie Hall with a string quartet. No matter how big Iggy Pop it wanted to play with us every time he did the the Tibet House concerts. And that was that was wild every time. Um, uh, we we played uh, this past year with Gogol Bordello, and we've we've played many times with with them. And they're you know there's just this crazy, uh, amazing, uh, energy filled band, um, and they love playing with the string okay. quartet. And so, and one set was playing with Gogol Bordello, and another set was playing with Maggie Rogers with just. Maggie and her guitar and her beautiful voice singing her gorgeous song and um for the one of the only times I ever 
had to rewrite an arrangement because in the in the sound in the very first rehearsal the arrangement I wrote was a little too heavy for what she was doing mm -hmm. and I felt awful I almost made her cry <laughs> made Maggie Rogers cry um, and but I said I will I will make this okay and the next day we came in for the for the dress rehearsal sound check and I had pared it down and it it went so beautifully with what she was doing and um, it was a magical experience so um, it's kind of cool for for Scorchio for us to be on stage and playing all these different styles of music um, and we, we also played with Laurie Anderson and I did a, a, a duo with Laurie on electric viola mm -hmm. and the quartet joined in and um, and we played with Maya Hawk, and and um, it was just just a fabulous energy that that goes on in in uh, in that event. And so, uh, and Joan Baez. Yeah, I was going to. I ask mean, you. that was just um, incredible, incredible time at the, you know, at the rehearsals. Just seeing that was you know the legend of Joan Baez, and and then to perform with her. And I don't know if you, there, there's a video of that performance where it starts out innocently enough with us playing with Joan and ends up into a, 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 a beat that they bring in a, you know, like a rock beat and she starts dancing and we're standing up and dancing. And it was phenomenal. It was, it was really such a, uh, such a poignant moment. And I will never, ever forget that. So Tibet House, do you want to speak to what it is and what the money goes for? Tibet House is, um, there is actually um, um, a, a place on, I think it's on 15th Street, um, but it, it serves to support and, and, and keep the uh, Tibetan culture alive because it's very much in danger from what's been going mm -hmm. on. Um, with China and, and and the Tibetan people, the Tibetan culture, the artwork, the music, and so it's it's a it's an opportunity for people to come together to really to honor the culture, to um, to honor the the musicians. With there's always um, Tibetan monks come in and perform, or they do the incantation at the very beginning. And uh, it's that's what it's about because the the Tibetan musicians they can't go back to their country and um, they can't go back to perform there. There are there are organizations that do send send back money. There's a you know for an orphanage or for other things. And this is specifically to help keep the culture alive. Mm -hmm. And the singer Tenzin Chogyal is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. So has he come in for those events since he lives in Australia? Yes, he comes in. Um, I don't have, at least if not, well, the, I think he's done it the last few years, but it, um, he's done it probably 10 times that, that I've been involved and we've become great friends and we've collaborated. Um, that's another one of those things where you, you know, you talk backstage and there's like, we said we should do something together and so we did. Yeah, I, I listened to Sutras of the Heart. I was hoping we could have a clip from that to point people towards that. Oh, album. yes, yes, please. That um, I have many people that tell me they, they meditate to that. Mm -hmm. That it just, it's the, it's the perfect meditating song. Um, so it, it's an honor for me to, for people to, to play it and, and work with it in that capacity. This is a clip from Sutras of the Heart by Martha Mook, featuring Tenzin Chogyal and Jesse Paris Smith. So you should see. fleeting world a star at dawn a bubble in the stream 
a flash of lightning in a summer cloud. A flickering lamp. A phantom. And a dream. Martha, do you meditate? I do. I don't listen to my music when I meditate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it's, a, yeah, it's a way for me to, you know, that this world can be so overwhelming most of the time. And how do you sort of regroup when it gets to be a little, a little too much? And, and so I find myself, I don't have a set schedule of when I do. I just, my body tells me yeah. when I need to recharge and I'll, you know, if I'm hanging out with family or friends, I'll excuse myself for a bit and put on my noise canceling headphones and put on just some generic sounds, usually some kind of a, a white noise because mm -hmm. I don't want to sing along. <laughs> I, you know, I don't want to hear the, the, the progression and know what, what chord is coming next. I just want to be, um, be in the moment. And, um, and I've actually s taken to uh, just putting a fan on at night also, because it sort of r works the same way. Um, it just having that white noise there helps the, helps the thoughts disperse. Yeah. And, and helps me regain the centered, centeredness that I need to. Mm -hmm. Do you? Yeah, I do. And I've spoken to a lot of um, serious meditators on this podcast, like Stephen Nachmanovich. And, you know, I won't go in Madeline Bruiser. I won't go into all the people mm -hmm. I've spoken with. But actually, I was thinking about him, of course, because of his book, Free Play and all that. I believe he has a six string viola like Tracy Silverman, but different. And I was wanted to ask you, have you gone over to the six string side and had that lower string you explored? Not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've, I've been a five stringer for, for a very long time. Um, but I'm in, I'm enticed. So, uh, and I have been, you know, talking with some powers that be about possibly delving into that, that world. So, uh, some of my students have been expanding, and yeah, that's um, Tracy came in to uh, do our work with our uh, strings program last mm -hmm. year in our symposium, and yeah, he swears by the six string, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which, which does make sense, but you know, you got to still give cred to the four <laughs> and the five. Um, I mean, there are people that swear by a seven string as well. So what do you do? Well, you have to adapt. Yeah, and. And um, so all my works are basically for five string, which could be easily played by six string. Uh, but the the beauty of the five string is that it's really um, a, a, a combination or a collaboration of violin and viola. So you can play repertoire, violin repertoire and viola repertoire seamlessly. It's just a matter of the clef. Yeah. <laughs> Now you've helped Yamaha develop develop some of their instruments over the years. Mm -hmm. What does that collaborative process look like? Another one of those moments where I I was introduced to um, I just at at um, at an event that had absolutely nothing to do with <laughs> strings. It was another product that they were they were trying. It was a, a Miburi. Um, like a, a MIDI uh, sensor suit okay. that was supposed to be originally de designed for music therapy where you, you touch different uh, spots and, and it, and it causes uh, like uh, sounds and music mm. to, to happen. And I started getting involved with that. But in the meantime, um, the, the, the emerging mar markets 
uh, folks found out about my playing of electric strings and and they said well we're starting to work on electric strings and can we send you a prototype so um, so they did and and that was how I got involved with Yamaha it's been probably over 25 years now and it, it, that was an instrument that started out just as a practice instrument just to facilitate so that you know kids or people living in close quarters could practice their scales without bothering their the rest of their family um, but I said to them this is very cool but I want to play it loud <laughs> and so I gave them feedback on it and then they also invited me to Japan to their um, headquarters in Hamamatsu and uh, I worked with a design team for a few days on different um, they were working on two different um, designs and so um, I gave them my my input on that and I, I continue working with Yamaha on, on um, giving my input as well as doing um, doing workshops and and um, they're very very supportive of ed music education and so they've been a big supporter of my program as well um, and they they're just a wonderful company to to be affiliated with so um, and I'm delighted and and um, there's always things coming up and I can't say what they are but there are things m more things coming up. okay have, have they um I bought one of those silent, so-called silent violins when they first came out, and I just found it so heavy. Have they lightened them up a bit? Yes. So a lot of that has to do with um, they were heavy because they had batteries yeah. in them. The, the whole system was uh, it was an active system, so that tends to make it heavy, mm. the instrument heavy. Um, with this instrument, the white the YEV um, and actually this is a this is a specialized uh, a customized uh, viola length YEV the, the, the regular ones are, are violin length but this is special made and um, it's really light because there's no there's no battery pack in here um, there is an, uh, a knob a volume control um, and usually when I'm performing, I, I perform with a, a, a wireless pickup system. Mm -hmm. But it's... Um, well, there's no body to speak of. Right. <laughs> so that doesn't add weight. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't need to. Um, however, there is resonance. Mm -hmm. And that, that does make a difference. But, um, yes, there are a lot of models of electric strings that they're they're uncomfortable to play because they're heavy the weight is not distributed evenly or something is not mm -hmm. quite right yeah i'll alert our um people listening on podcast platforms who can't see what i often do is i'll put a little gallery of images on my website associated Great. with this mm -hmm. episode so people can click in the show notes and see your viola and maybe some of the other oh, stuff uh that'd be cool yeah and uh, if anybody has any follow-up questions um, they're welcome to find me and send me you know Alec Viola on Instagram or whatever yeah well your, your website will be linked in any other links mm -hmm. of course okay. yeah so um, speaking of outreach we were just talking about uh, Yamaha you were recently in Jamaica yes first time in Jamaica um, that uh, yeah so I this is like, I feel like when I go into my, my honor, I teach an honors class at NJCU and every day I go in there and I said, this is going to be the best class yet. I love it. And it now, now it's a joke, you know, but, but I, I truly believe yeah. that, you know, so, and, and this is another thing that happens by circumstance that uh, in the symposium last summer that where Tracy Silverman was our guest artist and it turned out that one of the uh, faculty in the nursing department is Jamaican and she's um, very much um, um, a supporter of the arts 
and involved with music programs in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And she found out about the symposium and they, um, some of the music teachers from, from Jamaica, from Montego Bay, came to the workshop. They had never played a string instrument before, but the whole idea of this, and it's now become a collaboration, um, was to teach mu music teachers about string instruments, teach them the instruments and teach them how to teach so they can bring that back to the schools. Mm -hmm. And which is a very different approach to to teaching is not um, it's another word for it than p pedagogical, but um, that's that was the idea. So they came over last summer, and so we started collaborating. and um, And then they invited me to go over, and I t I took a couple of uh, another faculty member and a, uh, a current student of mine went, and we were there for about five days, uh, working. With uh, most of them, most of the participants are in in the band programs, mm -hmm. as are either as teachers or uh, as students, um, and and this um, this th the connection. Her name is Michelle. Um, she has a foundation, and they've been buying string instruments and and sending them to Jamaica. Oh. So we had we had a bunch of instruments to work with. So but we so the there will be more interaction. Um, in fact, they're planning to come back for our symposium this summer, and I'm, we're going to be doing Zoom calls and working with that. So the idea is to build up this string program in that part of the island, because it's on the other side of the island from Kingston, which is where the conservatory is mm -hmm. that has uh, you know, an orchestra program. Um, but we went out into the schools, we went out into a couple of high schools, and the students, they all wanted to play for us and sing for us. And um, and it was just, there was so much, um, I don't know, love and, 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 and eagerness in the room, and we, we, we played for them, and then we jammed with them. And um, it, was, it was a beautiful experience, um, very hot. <laughs> It's hot in Jamaica, <laughs> uh, but we did get to the beach one day. So, um, but yeah, so that that's I you know I I didn't set out to to create a, a new string program in Jamaica, but um, and I would you know it's one of those things that you see the value in it and what what it could mean for for. S students in any culture in any country um but especially for a a country where that they just don't they don't have that experience of working with you know with the string instruments and it takes a little more maintenance because of the the weather mm -hmm. and um but there there are ways to work around it and to work with it okay so i've been to cuba which is sort of similar, um, temp, you know, you mm. know temperament, temp, temperature, and um, and the the music uh, programs over there are just astounding. But they have also have the same issues of you know the music paper eventually just disintegrates, <laughs> um, and the and the instruments need additional maintenance. But um, when there's a will, there's a way, mm -hmm. and uh, so we're making this happen, and it's. Um, fills my heart. Yeah. So actually, I was thinking, um, you know, the hot weather about about the album Buzz that you were involved with, where uh -huh. these insect sounds were used. And I, I wanted to ask you about sound design. I was thinking, um, what is it called? Metacrosis? That, uh -huh. that piece. Because it's, you don't really recognize the viola in there. Are you using viola? In Metacrosis, I am... I am not using the viola. That is pure um, insect sounds being pro processed through basically the same effects processing that's in in this H90, and they are plugins. So in in the in I, I use Logic 
And what I did was I took these recordings of the of these um, insects, and I processed them and I composed them or recomposed them. And um, and that's how that's how that piece came about. There's another piece on the on the recording platycotus that does use the viola sounds as well as the insect sounds. Um, but I wanted to sort of create a, a kind of symphony, and that's what metacrosis is. And um, I got a note from the, um, the scientist that had actually recorded those sounds, and uh, he loves the piece. He says that um, they're so he can sense the, the respect to the, to the original insects, to their their being this in what I brought to them. So, um, and that was the, that was the intention. So, uh, yeah, I had fun with that. This is a clip from Metacrosis from the album Buzz using a variety of insect sounds recorded by Rex Cocroft. beautiful and inspiring yeah and I was curious about uh well all these things come to mind well one thing is um I would like to point people towards my uh episode with Lindsay Pollock the Australian musician who's a brilliant improviser and instrument builder out of everything and one of the things he did on that episode with me is he has these uh sounds sampled from nature like bird calls and frog sounds and then it's played through his midi wind wind instrument and then he can manipulate them. And that was really interesting. Mm. And he did that like in the session with me, he just showed me like options you can use. And that was a really inspiring way of hearing yeah. these beautiful um, nature sounds. And then I, I was wondering about sound design because a lot of these composers I've spoken to who do 
media composition, you know, it all often says sound design. And I've noticed, like, I just did a production with my orchestra. Um, it was a beautiful ballet that used music of Mahler, but then in between there was sound design and and actually some insect sounds. It was very interesting, the, the things they were manipulating. And I don't know the name of the person who created it. I should look that up. But I was listening to it thinking, well, what is sound design? How is it different than composition? Where where are we making this distinction? Ah, there's the blurry line. That's my, blurry line is my favorite line <laughs> <laughs> to traverse. Um, you know, it, it depends on how it's being used. Mm -hmm. Really, it depends on the end, the intention yeah. of it. So um, it could certainly be, uh, one day it could be, you know, a composition. The next day it could be used as a, as something that's sound design, meaning where, what, well, you're not, does that mean you're not actually supposed to pay attention to the music, but it's it's supposed to inform something about what's going on? Maybe that's the, that's the little uh, detail in there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, when I create, um, I, I think what I do is a combination of composing and sound design, mm -hmm. but I don't call it that. Yeah. I don't like labels. So now your first inspiration for getting an electric instrument was Jean-Luc Ponty. Yeah. Have you met him? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. When I was in high school, I was just a naive, you know, innocent viola player. <laughs> and, um, I don't know why somebody gave me, a, uh, or lent me an album, uh, called a taste for passion. And on it was Jean-Luc Ponty playing this gorgeous blue violin. And I, and I, uh, brought it home and played it vinyl cause that's what it was back then. And, um, and people are going to get tired of hearing this story, but, um, but you know, back in those days there were no emojis of, you know, <laughs> brains exploding but l that's what literally happened that was my one of my first revelation moments um because i just I, I remember listening to the album and just thinking i never knew a violin or a string player could do that could play like that could play a style like that uh, I mean, I knew about jazz, but I didn't know in that context of using electronics mm -hmm. and expanding the sound of the instrument in such a way that he he did and continues to do. And that really was a turning point where um, shortly thereafter, I had my, my parents drive me down to, to Manhattan when it used to be the, all the music stores on, you know, 48th Street and Manny's and Sam Ash and... And I actually bought the same version of the violin that he was playing. It was a, a blue Barkus Berry five-string electroacoustic violin. And um, I still own that, in fact. That was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, um, and so over the years, I just started exploring other string players. Of course, I, you know, I, I bought every Jean-Luc Ponty <laughs> album and then CDs came out so I was buying the CDs and I discovered Didier Lockwood and, and Michael Urbaniak and Noel Pointer and, and um, just any you know it's so hungry I just just searching and searching for electric string players there were almost no viola players that I, I could identify at that point um, in that in the concert music scene I didn't know at that point about John John Cale and the Velvet Underground. Oh, yeah. I did learn later on when I actually ended up touring with John and rec <laughs> and recording with John. Um, but he was sort of the, the godfather of electric viola <laughs> in, in, in his own way. Um, but yeah, so, so I was expanding and I wasn't really playing it anywhere except the basement of where I was living. I was, by then I it was in college and then gone to grad school and was starting to acquire pieces of equipment and um which were not 
like little pedals that we have now on the floor. They were like rack mount um, big pieces of gear. Mm -hmm. And um, and I started experimenting because it was another one of those things. It's like a, it's like a, you're building your own instrument, mm -hmm. and you could ask people what what gear they use, what amps they use, what effects they use, and everybody's going to tell you something totally different. I mean, uh, until you try, it's trial and error, and find the sound. Uh, like when you're trying out a you know an acoustic instrument, you're gonna it's going to have to resonate with you. It's going to have to, you want to, what it sounds like under your ear, what it sounds like in the, in the hall. And the same kind of thing when you're working with electronics. Um, and so that's why quality of sound is very important as well. So uh, over the years, then starting to meet other people that were doing improvisation and again, I would, I would, I was improvising, but in the privacy of my basement apartment, or I would, you know, put on John Luc Ponty recordings, and I would, I was also listening to the Turtle Island String Quartet, mm -hmm. and um, and just kind of jamming that way, and sort of building up my confidence and and um, and my repertoire, um, and then. Uh, there was one he he played at um, I think it was was at BB King's in and at the club in New York City I forget what what year it was way back in the uh, probably in the 90s at some point and oh yeah it was, must have been like 97 or 98 because I had just released my first solo album and Harmonic Vision and um, so I went I got a ticket I went to the show. I had the CD with me, and and I had to muster up all my courage to stand there and and sort of find my way backstage and meet him. And number one, to tell him what an influence he's been to me, mm -hmm. and you know, to all of the string world. Um, and number two, to give him my CD. <laughs> I think there had just been a review that came out in the Village Voice that that's another extinct piece of propaganda but um uh and and he was very gracious and um and then years later I n you know I n never heard from him again then years later I just took a chance and I sent a note to his website just to sort of you know maybe remind him and tell him where I was in my in the progress as an electric mm -hmm. violist and um and he wrote me right back and he and he said it, and in fact he was cleaning out uh, all these old recordings and and things and he d and he found my uh my album and he didn't throw it out so i felt really good about that <laughs> um and then over the years he he came uh on tour to play and then i met him again um backstage as an invited guest and and so we would we would, uh, you know, just write to each other quite a quite a lot, and it turned out that we were also playing some of the same electronic gear. Mm -hmm. um, and he heard. And then I sent him my album, uh, No Ordinary Window, which was using an, another new piece of gear, and he really liked the sound of that. And I said, "Oh, that's the H nine from Eventide," and he said, "Oh, I really like that." So I called up the people at Eventide and I said Jean-Luc Ponty really likes the H9 <laughs> sound on my album so I think the next day they brought it over to him in Paris and then he started using it so that was pretty cool and I think he's still still using it so um, yeah so that was another inspiration that and a mentor that um, is just a, such a beautiful and generous person and um, I, you know, I sent him a best wishes for his birthday a few months ago and and uh and he s sometimes sends me things that he's that he's working on and 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 he's just so you know oh coming from you that's such a you know thank you it really means a lot so uh it's he's a beautiful person i was listening to your album uh no ordinary window actually um you know we had that eclipse recently we didn't have totality here where i was living and i didn't 
you know, a great regret of my life. I didn't plan to get the glasses or go where I could have. So everyone else I know seems to have had this experience, but it was getting dark and I was walking back from an appointment, listening to that album of yours on my headphones. And it was very, very evocative and it was getting dark and I saw all these people on a hill with these glasses looking up and I was trying not to look up listening to you play. So it was just one of those moments. <laughs> Uh, wow. Well, I, I guess you didn't fall into any craters. On the... <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have to, I should put a, a, a warning on it if you listen to it. Well, now there's no CD players, but if you, back in the day, I would, I would sort of joke and tell people, you know, if you listen to it on the car, uh, in the car on the way home, don't, just don't drive <laughs> off the road. <laughs> it's trippy. It's great. Yeah, we still have CD players. This is a clip from Omotion from No Ordinary Window. Can I just uh, add one other thing, another uh, of my mentors and inspirations, Laurie Anderson? Yes, I, I was going to ask you about her. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, so, no, please do. <laughs> just. So, um, a, along with Jean Luc Ponty, uh, well, when I was doing that, that great exploration of electric strings and just non traditional string mm -hmm. things, I discovered Laurie Anderson as one does if you're a string player and if you're in the you know contemporary art world of sorts, and um, and became an instant fan, you know big science and you know follower and I went to um, see some concerts, and then as as a coincidence or maybe not as a coincidence, Laurie also um, is a is good friends with Philip Glass. And I got reacquainted with her at the at the Tibet House concerts back in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, and also when Lou was alive, Lou Reed, her husband, um, we played the quartet, backed up Lou in, a number of times at um, at Tibet House at Carnegie Hall. And then we also did a an event uh, for the ACLU. We did a lot of these kind of events. Mm -hmm. um, but then... I, I started to um, get friendlier with Lori, and she heard me play. She came to an event that I that I produced where we actually honored her. Um, uh, innovative women, what, what was it called? In new music or something, something like that. Uh, and I produced it at the cutting room, and it featured composers and and performers, um, and. Uh, and the and right after that, after she heard me play, she said, "Well, why don't we play something together at the Tibet House concert coming up?" And I think that was two, twenty fifteen. And so that was the first time I actually got to play with her, on the stage at Carnegie Hall, and we just kind of did an improvisation, and um, it was so magical. Just um, it was a conversation and. And there, I have I have pictures because there's always photographers there. Uh, in fact, one of the pictures actually made it into the BBC picture of the day. That of the two of us sort of um, playing at at Carnegie Hall, and and uh, there's other pictures with just have big smiles on our faces, and and so that was so, sort of the start of doing more collaborations and at Tibet House, and um, and then this past year. Uh, I was um, co-producing an event at the Cafe Carlisle, and I called Lori and I said, "You have any interest in playing at the Cafe Carlisle?" And that's, it's a night, you know, it's a cabaret, mm -hmm. and um, 
and it's not sort of a traditional venue for the likes of, you know, uh, experimental violin playing and such. Um, but it was a friend of mine is the is the pianist Earl Rose, uh, uh, the regular pianist there, and uh, so he asked me to sort of help set it up, and we performed, and um, we had such a beautiful time talking and playing, and um, and so was, since then um, there's another she has a new recording that's going to be coming out fairly soon, um, uh, Amelia Earhart on her based on her last voyage, mm -hmm. and um, I play quite a lot of electric viola on that. So um, that's another, and, and Lori's just a beautiful person as well. So I just, I feel so fortunate that um, to have met and worked with and, and formed these really significant friendships with these people that I, you know, just have been so, um, important in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, to close this out, you were t speaking about, you know, mentors you've, you've had a chance to become friends with and so on. Now you're a, a mentor to all the new generations coming up, but your path wasn't like super straight in terms of, you know, your path. And maybe it might just be interesting to reflect on that as both mentor and, and, you know, the twists and turns that led you to this unique career. Yeah, it, you know, now that I'm of a certain age and I can look back and sort of see how it made sense, but while I was traversing my career path, um, all I knew is I loved playing the viola <laughs> and I loved music and I loved a lot of different kind of music. And, um, I don't know, maybe because I allowed myself to be open to different kinds of experiences that I was I was tapped to play with some very interesting people and do some really amazing tours. Um, and the, the main thing, the main consistent thing along the line was that I made sure that the work that I did was quality. I made sure that I was professional in whatever I was I was doing, a good stand partner, uh, an attentive contractor, a, you know, a, a, a sensitive ear on a tour, um, with respect, always, always respect the crew when you're in a, any kind of production, whether it's a tour or whether you're on stage, always um, respect the production crew because they, they're the ones that really make you look and sound like you do, and um, and and they they just rarely get the respect that they deserve. So I that's something I learned, and that's something I also pass mm -hmm. on. Um, taking, I mean, I never journaled really. I just um, experiences along the way that happened and kept them in different parts of my my brain to to bring me to this point um, to understand that it's very much about the experience and that I can tell my students time and time again about you know do this this is this is what's going to happen but they're going to have to experience it and I can give them I can be a guide I can be a support system but I can't go through the experience for them and um and i think that's just i now i have i don't know is is it a luxury of looking of being able to look back or to have the perspective but i would never have known that 30 years ago when i was you know just trying to get my first solo recording and first solo concert without having to you know pay to rent the hall i didn't know where i was going to be ending up in another, you know, few decades. So, um, you know, be be true, be true to yourself, and be open. Um, one of my favorite sayings is, "You never know what you're missing until you know what you've been missing," which means there's a lot out there that you're missing, and um, 
um, and be a good person. <laughs> Add value. Yeah. Be someone that that adds value and makes this place a better uh, environment for having been in it. Well, thanks so much for sharing your perspectives and your music today, Martha. My pleasure. Thank you very much. This is this has been a really wonderful, engaging conversation. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please do share this with your friends and check out episodes you may have missed at leahroseman.com. If you could buy me a coffee to support the series, that would be wonderful. The link is in the description. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>